the best financial strategy during a crisis. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Bo, typically, there are things that can be learned during a crisis. There's also things that you're going to be in the middle of and you go, man, I wish I'd have known that going in, but there's definitely something I'm going to internalize and then I'm going to make sure in the future Mm -hmm. I don't get myself in this situation again. Now, what I think is so exciting, Brian, is whether this is like a fortunate or unfortunate thing, we've been through crises before, whether it be... Uh, the dot-com bubble or 9-11 or the Great Recession or fill in the blank. We've been here before, and one of the great things you said is after a crisis, you can learn a lot from there. You get to kind of do an after-action review. And we thought, well, maybe there are some things that we've learned from prior previous experience that we can share that might be valuable as we approach this or even the next crisis. So let's see if there's some planning opportunities and things that you can figure out how this works with your financial situation so you not only go into this the next time stronger, better, and more prepared, you will be in a much better place to tackle this. So number one, give it gas and drive through it. (laughs) I think I think we 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 talked about this in pre-show. You guys love recirculating this picture that Daniel created. And this is supposed to be because he did somehow he found a picture of the hat that I had when I worked at Hardy's. I was I was the crew leader working the drive through. I mean, if you drove through the Hardee's in McDonough, Georgia, more than likely you saw me working there. <laughs> and I'll never forget that it was at Hardee's that, you know, Days of Thunder, uh-huh. Tom Cruise, yep. Robert, Robert Duvall, Duvall, and others. It was they, they it was big hit movie, and that we were the big sponsor restaurant. And in that movie, which I rewatched probably in the last 12 months, <laughs> I'll never forget. Cole Trickle gets in a situation where he has this horrible car accident and he's just not the same driver anymore. So Robert Duvall, his character tells Tom Cruise, hey, when you when you see the smoke, when you see the accident coming ahead of you, just drive through it. Just You've got to hit the gas and, drive, and through drive through it. And kind of and, and if you're making an analogy, we are in that situation right now. There's definitely smoke. We're concerned. We're fearful. And you're trying to figure out you have an investment plan. You have a dollar cost averaging plan. You have monthly 401k contributions. And you're like, do I just do I just panic and pause and stop and stand still? Because you guys, I hear you say stand still, but what does that mean for my future investments? Sure. We're saying no. If you're 20 years, if you're in your 20s, if you're in your 30s, you're in your 40s, even 50s, if you've got five years before you retire, all those systematic savings plans still need to be rocking and rolling. So keep buying equity investments. Keep so, buying risk on assets. It sounds like what I'm he- hearing you say is that I- if you have planned appropriately and planned correctly, when you see volatility or when you see a downturn or when you see discomfort or when you see scary things, that's not the time to be adjusting course, changing strategy, making moves, trying to figure your way out of it. All of that planning and thought and preparation should have probably happened before you got into the mess. It's just like in your race car driving analogy, it's the reason they have on the suits and the helmets. Yep. They don't try to put the helmet on while they're getting into the, into the crash. <laughs> that probably would be counterproductive. <laughs> I think it's also, we will look back in five to six years and the, the people who made money on this, there's going to be a lot of people who go, man, look how lucky that person is sure. financially. They, they, Man, it must be great that they had this opportunity to do it. I, it's just like people from the 2008 and nine collapse were real estate... I have clients that bought rental property Mm -hmm. back then that are sitting quite nicely now. And you look at them and go, wow, how did they know to do that? Did they have some crystal ball, some magic tea leaves? No, guys. You just have to look at the current financial situation, see where the opportunities are, and be willing to maximize the opportunity. And a lot of people, they think about this when they look back and they go, how did they know about the financial opportunity? Guys, the opportunity is big enough to drive a truck That's through. Exactly this is right. not something that requires you to be a genius. When you see that valuations of companies, like price earnings ratios of the stock market of the S&P 500, is getting down to historic lows, it gets kind of easy to see. Absolutely. We're probably getting closer to a bottom than we are to the, the to the locking in the losses that we've fallen down from. So keep buying those risk assets. And one thing that we get all the time is people say to us, oh, well, Okay, I hear you say keep buying, but I don't know where the bottom is. Why don't I just wait until it gets to the bottom and then I'll start buying? Well, that's great. If you wouldn't mind sharing with us where the bottom is going to be, then we'll all just make tons of money. What actually happens is we never know exactly when that knife is going to hit the bottom. We never actually know when it's going to bottom out. So 
while right now today may not be the lowest point that the market's going to get to, it's still a great buying opportunity. You don't have to get it just right. If you can get close over the long term, you're going to be successful. Yeah, and that's why we, we're going to talk later about the importance of creating a systematic savings yep. plan and why that way you can take the emotional part out. But here's let's move on to number two. We talk about this is a tool you can use. It's called harvesting losses. This is something that I want in your Batman utility belt. I want you to have this tool. And Bo, what's the power of this? Yeah, so this is actually one of the things I would say probably at, at the firm, at Abound Wealth Management, we've been doing the most in the past week or two. This has probably been the most active thing that we've been doing. So let's go to like a Webster's Dictionary definition. What is tax loss harvesting? Well, tax loss harvesting is the practice of selling a security that has a loss by realizing the loss, investors may offset taxes on gains and or income in the future. What this doesn't say is I'm going to sell a security at a loss and just have it go to cash and just have it sit there. When <laughs> that's you called tax, a panic sell. That's called moment. a panic sell. When you tax loss harvest, you're actually recognizing a loss without changing your overall investment plan and investment strategy. Yeah, and what I like about it is, is that, look, we know markets are down, likely have a V-shaped recovery, and, and Bo, there's even a perfect il illustration. Let's take two people that start at $10,000. Let's show the differences between this. Sure. So let's say that we have two investors, uh, and this is FTED Daniels uh, doing it. Let's say we have two investors, Tony and Teresa, and they both have $10,000 that they're going to invest just in a broadly diversified index fund. Well, let's assume that for both of them, the value of the investment drops by 10%. So yeah. they both had $10,000 invested, and then it goes down 10% down to $9,000. Well, Tony, he says, you know what? I listened to the Money Guy show. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell that index fund at $9,000, and I'm going to immediately go vest, invest that $9,000 in a different index fund. It's similar, same type of asset class, same type of investment opportunity, but it's not identical. It yeah. is materially different enough that I'm not just buying more of the same thing, I'll have a little bit of a difference. So maybe one international index to another. That way you avoid the wash sale rules. There's no wash sale when that happens. So Teresa, on the other hand, she does nothing. She just lets her $10,000 go down to $9,000. Well, then the investments, both of them come back up. And let's say that the value of the investment for both of them goes back up to $10,000. So they both have an investment portfolio of $10,000. Well, what's actually happened is Tony, because he sold at nine thousand and reinvested, he actually has a thousand dollar loss that he capitalized on or that he harvested that he can use to offset any capital gain income this year and can even potentially use it to offset up to $3,000 of ordinary income. And if he has so much losses that not only does he offset all of his capital gains, not only does he offset $3,000 of ordinary income, he can actually carry those losses into future years and yep. use them in future years. What I like about it, this is, this is a strategy that don't overcomplicate this. All this is allowing you to do, you don't put your money on the sideline. You just lock in the paper loss. Mm -hmm. That way it serves as a tax benefit, meaning that you might actually get a refund of some money when you file your taxes yep. in April. The other thing it does is we know year in, a lot of mutual funds and other things issue out a lot of investment income. If you lock in these losses, it at least allows you to have an offset to that income. So once again, lowering that tax bill with really out changing anything in your risk profile, not changing much in your behavior of how you're structuring your investments. It's just utilizing the tool to save as much as you can off of taxes. So this is a great thing. We talk about all the time. This is one of the things that we use when we are in some of these volatile times. It's a tool we use as we're perpetrating rebalancing for clients or getting portfolios back into the right mix to take advantage of some of the volatility. Tax loss harvesting, just like you said, it is a great tool in the Batman tool belt that you ought to think about using. So let's talk about dollar cost averaging. Oh, this another is another yep. tool that I think is so powerful because why do we even talk about dollar? We talk about dollar cost averaging, whether we're in good markets, bad markets, normal markets, it doesn't matter, but they're especially powerful in a, a very crisis driven market because there's so many irrational things going on. The news media is freaking you out. Your relatives are freaking you out. You know, everybody, it seems like you talk to is panicking about what's going on. And you're like, well, should I? Should I stop? Should I not buy anything else yep. in the future? Is this the right time to buy? Was last week the right time to buy? Here's what we have a tool that will help you know the right answer. So again, let's go back to just textbook definition here. What is dollar cost averaging? 
Well, dollar cost averaging is an investment strategy that involves regularly and systematically investing into the market often every month or every year. So it's systematically entering money into the markets on a, on a regular basis. Now, one of the most easy, common, most familiar ways that every person can think about this is when you're investing in your employer-sponsored retirement plan, whether that be a 401k or 403b or 457 or, or simple IRA, those contributions, those payroll contributions you're doing are a perfect example of dollar cost averaging in practice. Yeah, and the only thing, and this is another thing I wanna, since this is takes the emotion out of it, makes it a systematic process, Think about people, we've done episodes where we're trying to figure out dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing. Yep. You sell a business, you sell a piece of real estate, you know, you come into a big chunk, you're trying to figure out if you have a seven figure payment that has come to you and you're trying to figure out, do I put it all in at once or do I spread it out over a period of time? Guys, this downturn is a perfect example. We've shown you this in a lot of research. Between 10 to 12 months, you don't gut your long-term mm -hmm. performance. But man, can you mitigate some major risk if you do spread that money out over time? Because think about somebody who comes into a million, a, a seven-figure portfolio sure. right now, a windfall. If you'd put that money in three weeks ago mm -mm. and then watched, I mean, even a diversified portfolio potentially probably could be down 15 to 20%. Yep. An undiversified, meaning all risk assets, would be down easily 30 to 35%. Yep you would be disgusted. However, if you are buying this over a period of time, like I said, we typically, the research shows 10 to 12 months is not going to gut the long-term performance because there's only a few percent difference sure. in the research that Vanguard and others have done, but still it protects you. And all of our clients, because we do have some that are lump sum investing. And as a matter of fact, I had a call about two weeks ago with a client, we were buying into this downturn and he, was, he called me that morning. He goes, hey, I know we're slated to buy this morning. Can we can we cut it off today and just wait a few more weeks? And I was like, like no, 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 you're missing it. <laughs> that is not how systematic dollar cost averaging works. We are just consistently buying all the way through the process. That way you're, you're taking advantage of the drive through it mentality that I've already talked yep. about, but you're also taking the emotions out of the process. So just how powerful can this be? Again, we thought maybe this would be valuable for us to look at a case study, yep. an example of how powerful it could be. So we went and looked. Uh, and we decided, let's not just go back to the Great Recession, 2008. Let's go even back to the big one, to the big, nasty, dirty one, the Great Depression. Yep. What does that look like? And this is what we know. If you look at the Dow, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it closed at $381 on September 3rd of 1929. Well, if you fast forward 25 years into the future, on November 23rd of 1954, it closed at three hundred and eighty-three dollars. So it what a horrible went up time to two dollars in twenty-five years. That is a horror. I mean, this is one of those things where you're like, "Oh my goodness, we've gone twenty-five years. I've made absolutely nothing except for the dividends, the interest that sure. might be on my portfolio." That is a horrible time to be an investor, or is it? Or is it? So we said, what if we took a hypothetical $10,000 and we just invested it every single year beginning on September 1st, 1929, all the way through November 1st, 1954. So essentially, we would be investing $260,000 over that time period. Again, if you took two sixty dollars and just invested on... 1929, it would have been worth a little bit more than 260 in 1954 if you did a lump sum. But if you were to perpetrate this $10,000 per year dollar cost averaging stat, drive through it, drive through it, uh, and you assume that we just let the dividends reinvest each year, what you would have found is at the end of this 25 year period, the $260,000 investment compounded to a value of one and a half million dollars or an 11.7% annualized rate of return. Guys, keep investing. Take the emotions out of it. Dollar cost averaging can definitely be your friend. Um, and that, that leads to number four. This is, I always like to tell people, a lot of us will have portfolios that it looks like a quilt. <laughs> You're like, how did I get here? You know, you have a retirement plan here and so forth. And it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that you'll have some maybe grandparents gave you a, mm -hmm. an individual stock. You have a mutual fund that you bought, but it actually did okay pretty sure. well. So you had an embedded gain that you didn't want to go generate taxes. And it was it was not a great investment, but it was good enough that you didn't want to go s generate a yep. lot of taxes by selling it. 
a lot of your legacy holdings that you're kind of stuck with, this is a great time to reevaluate because usually you can get away from worrying about the taxes as much. The impact is much smaller. So we are telling people, if you have individual stocks or mutual funds that no longer kind of fit into your model and you, you know, and now taxes are no longer a big issue, this is the time to take action. Yeah, it's exactly right. Uh, one of the things that we believe in is whenever it comes to portfolio design and construction, whenever like a new potential client comes to us, we don't believe in apple cart turnover. We just sell everything and buy all new stuff that we would prefer. Right. We actually analyze the current portfolio. Well, one of the things we do find is that a lot of clients have those legacy positions. This is a great opportunity to either harvest losses in those or even do gain matching, where you sell enough losses to offset the gains, to have a net neutral trade. It's a great opportunity to be doing that. So go. we're not saying go to cash, but we are saying make sure you're looking at your portfolio and seeing if this isn't a great time to prune some of the older stuff you don't necessarily love anymore to make better use of it for the future. Yep. So number five. Turbocharge paying yourself first. What do I mean by this? Turbocharging paying yourself first is we tell you, we want you to have a cash management plan where every month you are investing to grow your invest investments for the future. Well, a lot of us are now working from home. Mm -hmm. our, our, daily, our monthly expenses are down right now. Now look, there's a lot of people that are hurting. Sure. Hospitality industry, other things. That, that Not necessarily talking to them, but I'm talking about there are people that they're, they're their expenses have gone down. They've got this situation where they're trying to figure out what should I be doing behaviorally or mm -hmm. financially to maximize. I'm telling you, even for myself, I was on a pay down my mortgage as fast as I could. I'm in my late 40s. Mm -hmm. I want to be debt free, but I'm in my early 50s completely, and that mortgage is the only debt I have. So I was hyper accelerating what sure. I was paying down. I recognize valuations of the financial markets are way down. This is that once every few, you know, few years bear market that mm -hmm. comes our way once a decade. So I have once again repositioned where I'm no longer hyper paying down that low interest 3.5% mortgage. I'm now putting that money into my dollar cost sure. averaging strategy. So that's why I'm saying if you can look at your financial situation and you have the extra margin, the extra capacity, because go put it to work. This is the opportunity to kind of squeeze paying yourself first to maximize what you can do for the future. Now, I want to make sure that I heard what you did say, and what, and then I want to make sure I heard what you did not say. Yeah. You did not say, hey, what I recognize is there was this once a decade opportunity, and so I went and took my three months emergency reserves yeah. or my six months emergency reserves, and I went and decided to plow that into the market and get it working for me. That's not what you said. You also didn't say, hey, I recognize that interest rates are at all time low. So I went and did a cash out refinance on my mortgage <laughs> and pulled the cash out and put yeah. it in the market. That's not what you said. You said, hey, I had this one strategy where I was employing dollars or for folks out there, maybe your expenses are down and there's extra money left over. It is accelerating your investment or taking advantage out of the margin, not stealing from the foundational things that you need in place to make sure that you have yourself covered if this thing gets No, scarier. you're a spot on. you got to have your emergency breaks. That's your cash reserves. They have a moat around them that you're not touching, that you're keeping those assets safe, liquid, so that way you can keep your financial life out of the ditch. But if you do have extra margin, extra capacity, it's, it's the whole Warren Buffett thing. Instead of pulling out a thimble, That's right. you're pulling out a wash tub exactly to go collect right. as much as you can of the opportunity. That's Love all it. we're saying is be opportunistic, but do not put your financial life in the ditch. Love it. Number six, rebalance. Oh, great opportunity to rebalance. I mean, this is one of those things. Realize what happens in a declining financial market is that your equity assets, your risk on assets will get smaller. They'll get beat up, but your conservative assets, one more benefit to having diversification will probably stay steady, if not even go up a little sure. bit. So your asset allocation might get a little out of wonk. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you're going to have risk assets are down, non-risk assets are doing okay. It might make sense to, from time to time, harvest losses yep. and coordinate that with rebalancing so that you can make sure that you're taking advantage of this unique opportunity. Now, we've said this before, but it bears repeating rebalancing is exactly what you said, tweaking around the edges to get your allocation back to what it should have been. It is not completely changing your allocation. If you are 80-20, uh, rebalancing doesn't mean I go to 100-0 or a 60-40. It's about getting back to where you should have been originally, not revamping the whole strategy. That's exactly right. You're not reactionary. That's right. You had a sound mind plan going into it. You're not reacting now. Love it. 
Number seven, Roth conversions. This is one that I think is great because while assets are down, you can convert more assets that, that are tax deferred, like your 401ks, your rollover IRAs, mm-hmm. and those type of things. While they're compressed, the opportunity built into those assets is even more so now to convert them so that when we get a recovery, the tax, the growth will be completely tax free. Sure. Now, hear me out on this. There's a tightrope that you have to walk. It's just like right now, I'm sad. Some of my clients, every year we do a Roth conversion, but we have to wait for the end of the year to see, do a tax projection because you've got Social Security Mm -hmm. considerations. You've got Affordable Care Act consideration. You have Medicare premiums Mm -hmm. that are considerations. All these variables go into it, but that doesn't mean, for especially those clients that are between 50 to 72 years of age, if you know that there's a safe level of Roth conversion you can do that's not going to trigger any of those things that are income-based, you might want to consider it right now. It's not crazy. Now, here's the thing. Roth conversion, just like you said, you, you can have a great idea that has a lot of unintended consequences you did not realize in terms of triggering taxability on Social Security and Medicare and all those things. It's a pretty, um, I don't want to say complicated, but it's an advanced strategy. If you're someone who's thinking about perpetrating that kind of strategy, it might not be a horrible idea to get a second opinion. Reach out to a financial advisor. Reach out to your tax preparer. Ask somebody who actually understands them, hey, is this what makes sense for me? Is this something I should consider doing? I want to close out this section with number eight. This is, this is, this is one of those finger-wagging old man on the porch <laughs> moments, and I don't mean to be that way, but there, I think it is important that we understand our behavior and what the terms mean. There is a huge difference between being an investor – versus a speculator. Oh, yeah. So an investor has a long-term plan. They're they're putting assets to work out in the market that they're forgetting for the next five to seven years. They have a long-term mindset. It's all part of a diversified plan. It, it takes into account cash flow, goals, risk profile, their age, your liquidity. All those things are built into it with a sound mind plan. Yep. A speculator sees that this stock that maybe is in your town or it's in a sector that you love or you heard that from a a, a brother-in-law that this stock was getting beaten up right now, a speculator tries to swoop in, take advantage of that super low price, and then, you know, make a little money, gamble a little bit. And I'm not even against you being a speculator, but with a very small percentage of your assets. I really wouldn't get crazy with more than 2 to 3% of your investable assets in speculative actions. I mean, we're even, I mean, we do this stuff yeah. literally for ourselves, but it's very small. Yep. If you look at our asset allocation, we are practicing what we preach, our long term assets. It's, just, it's so funny. I have a neighbor, best friend, that um, he's like, every year he calls me up because he, he loves the individual stock play. And he's like, Dad gummit, if the SP didn't beat it again. He <laughs> goes, I, I, I keep, t- your voice rings in my ears every year when I do my annual analysis and I see how good the SP 500 did. Yep. And I'm like, that's because you're betting into the optimism of innovation, of a growing, successful economy. I know that looks dark and, and, and in these hard times when markets are down, but it is an ever growing pizza pie that you are buying into a slice of. So take advantage of that. That's why we love broad diversification, not speculating and just trying to pick the next stock that you can make money off of. Now, what happens is, is when we ever get in the thick of those, the, these things, our mind can play tricks on us and it can convince us, oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not speculating. I'm just a I'm just a smart investor and I can see the trend and I can see the thing. Here's the gut check you can always do to figure out if what you're doing is investing or if it's speculating. Whatever you're going to buy or whatever allocation you're going to have, whatever you're going to whatever you're going to do, if you had to lock it up in a box for 5 to 10 years and not touch it, not be able to sell it, not be able to look at it, would you still do it? I'd make the argue if your answer is oh no no no, I just I, I want to be able to, I want to sell it when it pops then you're speculating. Yeah. If you could put in a black box and not touch it for a decade, that means you're probably a long-term investor thinking about it the right way. Yeah, because you got it right on the front end. That's so right. that's those are all things that you can do right now to prepare yourself or, or, or make yourself better during this financial crisis. Mm-hmm. I want to kind of pivot because there are some things that you just can't do the action right now. We've got You've gotten yourself in this situation and reacting would could be the worst thing you could sure. do for yourself. But I do want you to recognize... When you're in this moment of a downturn, in this moment of a crisis, 
there are things that I want you to put yourself on the spot with to create a homework list for the future mm -hmm. that you will promise yourself you'll never, ever, ever get yourself in this situation again. This is essentially, again, we're pulling on the experience we have from, from past downturns to figure out what should, as you move through this, what should your after action review uncover? So let's jump in and I'm going to be a little self-deprecating on this first one. <laughs> okay. Number one is knowing the value of having cash. And yep. there's probably a lot of you right now that are experiencing this is that you're like, oh my gosh, the market's down. All that liquidity I had in the stock market, I don't want to touch that now because sure. they're all down 20, 25, 30, 35%. Yep. I can't touch that. Yep. And you're realizing, I need cash. Okay. Cash makes me sleep better at night. So here's the thing I will tell you in 2008, I had the, I had this house down in Georgia that had six figures of equity. It had so much equity that the banks were were sending me notifications, hey, no cost closing, no income verification mm -hmm. required and we'll, no, you know, we'll just give you a checkbook, we'll give you a debit card, it doesn't matter. You're going to have instant access to this equity. I was like, who needs cash? I'm smarter than this. Cash doesn't pay anything right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of this home equity, this six figures I'll keep my money working for me, earning more than what mm -hmm. cash is paying. And then if I ever get stuck in a bond, I'll just go pull it off this home equity line. I'll be okay. Sure. What could go wrong? Well, you guys know the rest of the story. And we should have had FTE Daniel pull those slides we did when we mm -hmm. did the financial mistakes show. I got a letter from Wachovia at the time. It became Wells Fargo. But they sent me a letter saying, hey, you know that equity that we told you you had access to? Just kidding. Our fancy dancy computer algorithm has told us your property is not worth anything anymore. So we're shutting it down. So I got that letter and you can imagine I felt very naked. Sure. Because it worked right now in a crisis. And I'm like, where's all my liquidity? I don't have, I'm running a company. Where's the liquidity go come from? And that's what I remind people. Downturns don't just happen one at a time. You will likely experience negative things and a bunch of stuff at once. The housing market will go through a crisis. You'll lose your home equity line. Your stock portfolio will go down. You might lose your job at the same time. All these things will happen all at once. You better be prepared, so understand the value of having cash. Yeah, if you are someone who's recognizing that you are lean, you should begin thinking about not, not necessarily selling assets and liquidating and try to shore it up, but you might have to do the uncomfortable thing of paring back your savings until you get your cash reserves built up to that appropriate level because emergency funds are there for emergencies. Yeah. And the thing that almost every emergency has in common is that you didn't know it was coming. That's the thing that makes it an emergency. That's why you got to have it there. So internalize what you're going through right now and do like I did in 2008. Promise yourself the next time you come into a crazy situation like we're currently facing, you'll have cash. Love you'll it. have liquidity. Yep. So that leads to number two. Review your risk tolerance and risk capacity. A lot of you guys, here's the thing. I've been managing money for people so long that I have now come to spot the people that think that they're cowboys, but they're really, they're not even Tonto. They're not, they're not even, I mean, they're not even the cook that's cooking the beans in the cowboy camp. I mean, they, they are scared because I had, I, I'll give you a perfect case study. 2003, I got a brand new client, January 2003. And that's an important day because there was a downturn dot com bubble mm -hmm. from 2000 all the way to about November of 2002. So I get this brand new client, 2003, scared to death of investing because we just came through the dot-com. So I set them up a very moderate portfolio. And it, much more complicated than this, but for just illustration, it was like a 60-40 sure. type portfolio. Well, then we have 2003 where the market made over, I mean, it was 30%. Yeah, right, right I mean, it was there. a great year. And I can still remember that one-year client meeting. And the client was like, man, we did great, but did you see what the S&P 500 did last year? I want some of that. And I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> you, you forget. You came in here scared to death. Yep. You were a scared little person. The problem is we've had a market from 2009, the March of 2009 recovery, all the way through here in the beginning of 2020. It's been a bull market. Mm -hmm. We have, in that decade of, of up making money, I think have forgotten Hey, this thing can give it back That's in right. a short period of time. So a lot of you have lost what is risk tolerance versus risk capacity. So let me explain these things to you because we do have downturns. This is pruning the behavioral aspect. Risk tolerance, that's that when people ask you questions of 
How do you react when the market's down 20%? Do you buy more? Do you say pat? Or do you sell everything? They're trying to figure out what your internal capacity to understand risk is. Sure. Bo, explain to them what risk capacity is. A risk capacity is based on your unique financial circumstance. How much risk can your portfolio withstand? Meaning, if you're living off of these assets, or you're getting close to retirement, you might not have enough time for the markets to recover so that you can get back to the standard of living you are accustomed to. So tolerance is how you feel about risk. Capacity is how much you can or should actually take. Yeah, the big thing is, I know a lot of you, there's some 75-year-olds that maybe you are a business owner, you are an entrepreneur, you could have the risk tolerance of a young lion. I mean, you could be ready to conquer the world, but once you're in your, your mid-70s, you don't need to be taking the same sure. risk as a 20-year-old. Even if you have the ability to tolerate it, it's a bad move because exactly what Bo said, you don't have the years to recover, exactly so right. take that into account. Review. Right now, you're probably, you know if you got way out ahead of your skis on your risk, because I get it. I talk to clients and I talk to friends all the time. You're like, cash pays nothing. I don't want to have my money in cash. I don't want to have it in bonds. Bonds are horrible. I need to have it in equity so I at least make something. Remember, there is this neighbor that pops in from time to time to collect his pound of flesh, which is volatility. Mm -hmm. And we are experiencing that right now. So Bundle up what you're experiencing and see if you got the risk tolerance and risk capacity right as you go forward. Here's a really easy gut check. If you're losing sleep right now because of your portfolio and it's really causing you to stress and it's actually eating in to the joy and happiness you feel in your everyday life, you might not have your risk right in the portfolio. Yeah, so get that right. Don't react while you're in the middle of a crisis. Get it right while you're part of the sound mind plan. While things are reasonable, you can process everything. Sure. Number three. Asset allocation and reflect on your why. Mm -hmm. This one really ties in nicely to the risk part because there is a point where I think people say, well, gosh, why would you ever want to have bonds in your portfolio? Why would you ever do this? I want to, you know, there's a lot of research out there that shows that you should always, you know, especially if you go out to the fire boards out there, the financial independent retire early, they've done a lot of research where they say a 70-30 portfolio or an 80-20 portfolio, meaning 70% risk assets, 30% non-risk. That might be better than the traditional 60-40 or even a 50-50 as you get older. Sure. Yes, there's a lot of research out there. Sure, the more risk you take with the S&P 500, probably the greater rate of return you'll have historically. There's one big fallacy to a lot of that research or those data points. It's not even really research. It's more of data harvesting the points is that we are behavioral herd animals, mm -hmm. and you better make sure you have your risk profile right, the asset allocation right, because it does need to reflect your why. If you're somebody who's won the game, the financial game of life, why should you be in such heavy risk assets and jeopardizing your success if you've already won the game? Yeah, I think that's great. One of the questions that we use sometimes to kind of help clients figure this out and think about it, said, okay. Uh, if you had $100 million tomorrow, what would you do with it? Yeah. Right? Because what, or we say, what is your risk capacity? And there's generally two answers. Oh, well, you know, I could just put in a coffee can in the backyard, and I would never need to invest, and I'd be fine. It's a true statement. The other thing is, is I could invest in the most aggressive things I could possibly come up with. Because even mm -hmm. if I lost 90% of it, I still got $10 million bucks. Neither of those answers is wrong, but it's very much individualized to the person. So you have to, just like you said, understand your why and make sure that your portfolio reflects what the why is. Oh, so powerful. Um, here's one. This is kind of touching feeling, but I think it's so powerful. Right now, number four is, is there something you've missed during this quarantine or during this downturn? I'll tell you, my wife, she looked at me the other night and she goes, I'm so ready to just go out to eat again. Because we, <laughs> you know, you just can't, we take for granted when you're going through a crisis where you're in lockdown, you're not allowed to really go anywhere. You, it's, it's the simple things. It's going and visiting you know, neighbors. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to go visit your relatives, especially the ones that are over 70 sure. years of age. It's going out to eat. There's a lot of things that I think now that we're separated from it, we realize how much we appreciate it sure. and how much we miss it. So use this crisis, use this downturn to think about the things that you miss and then figure out when we come out of this, can you do more, more of those things that bring you fulfillment and happiness? I love it. That's perfect. Um, it goes back. I mean, I can't help myself because 
baseball games, concerts. There's so many things that we've canceled just that we just go into a movie. Yeah. How fun oh. would it be to go see a movie right now? It seems crazy while we're in this <laughs> this whole thing. It shows just how odd this this time of life is. Number five, and this is kind of the last part that I want to close with, and I've used this on a, a few shows, but I think it is so worth repeating. As a matter of fact, we even ha- we had a team meeting, mm-hmm. and um, Bo, you you started you and I started working together in 2008. That's right. And I told you in 2008 because it was that's when the the Great Recession started, and I said, Bo, this is powerful. Mm-hmm. This is everything you're experiencing right now. Every one of these fearful f- client calls you're hearing me deal with. Handle it. What's fun for me is fast forward. Now you're a seasoned financial advisor, and we have our team meeting with all of our you know associates and mm-hmm. other lead financial advisors here. And I kind of hear you giving the same oh, yeah. advice to them: is that bottle this up. You are getting an education here that is worth so much. Yeah, I think what's amazing is um, I've had again just tons of calls with clients, talking with you know 401k providers and. Um, I'm just not freaking out. I'm just not yeah. like overwhelmed right now. And I think the reason is, is because I've been here before. I've done this before. I've experienced this before. The Great Recession taught us that. So if you're in this and you just recognize, man, either one, I don't like the way this feels and I want to change it. Or, man, I have some uncertainty. How do I approach this? Or whatever the thing may be, bottle it up because this thing right now, however you handle this, will prepare you for the next time we'll see this because we'll see it again. This is not going to be the last major crisis, major economic event that we're going to go through. The better you can weather this, the better prepared you'll be to weather the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. Well, you'll you'll see. Fast forward a year, 18 months, whatever it takes, we will come out of this and financially we'll all be rewarded. I want you to look back Think about, did you handle this well? Would your older self be proud of you sure. and the way you handled this? Or they look at you like you had a chicken with your head cut off and be like, oh my God, they did not handle that crisis well at all. No. I mean, these are the things you need to use this as a teachable moment. Wisdom comes from experience, guys. And there's so much opportunity in these downturns that you do get to test those asset allocations. You get to see what's your metal on how you handle mm-hmm. buying more or staying the course with your 401ks and your other systematic savings plans. This is going to be where it is. And it leads to a graduation point. If you do this right, and I love this because I asked Daniel and he blew my mind on how good it. I said, you know, if you do this right, you will graduate. You'll almost have a diploma that you can hang on the wall that you graduated from the school of hard knocks. And so Brian said this. And of course, FTED came up with a school of hard knocks diploma bequeathing to you as a seasoned investor your official recognition that you made it through it. Although there's a typo I see on here. It says one president and then one vice vice president. Oh, it does. I, I thought it should have said assistant, assistant to the president. To the president. Uh, you know, kind assistant of a, 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 a Dwight type <laughs> reference there. But it is Daniel even went so far as to put a seal on here. If you actually could see that seal on the screen, it is that detailed. But it is true. I mean, we say this and and Jess, we say this in fun. But guys, this is you are going through a moment in your life that if you do it well learn well from it, it will serve you for the rest of your life. This could be some of the most powerful things and skills that you can develop in your seasoned investor financial mastery toolbox. So take advantage of it. And Bose, this ties into, we have some great deliverables on our website. Yeah. If you haven't had a chance to go out to the Money Guy website, you can go to moneyguy.com and click on our resource page. And like one of the resources we have out there right now is five ways that you can deal with investment uncertainty. You can go out there, download this. It's 100% free. Feel free to take it, print it, put it on your bathroom mirror, email it to your friends. Uh, when you're allowed to go back to work, take it to work, pass it out to your colleagues. This is one of the things you can use to help you stay sound and pragmatic and level-headed. And we know that those who can remain calm and level-headed and pragmatic through these crazy times are the ones that likely come out of it much stronger because of it. Well, we've been doing some unique things. We have our live Q&A shows that we're almost doing. Well, we are doing them weekly now. Um, We've got these deliverables. People are probably who are brand new. We're getting new people all the time. And they're like, wow, these guys are just giving it away. This is some of the best content I'm seeing out there. How can they afford to do this? Guys, this is all part of the abundance cycle. We want you to come learn, apply, 
and grow your own personal finance. Is there no ask whatsoever? We give this to you as a value add because we think if we pay it forward, good things will happen. There is the only ask and the only catch is that you will reach a level of success at some point if you do this right, that you're going to say, man, my processes, my personal finances have reached a level of success that I can't do this on my own. Yep. I'm scared. Of, I don't know what I don't know, or I'm worried about my loved one who, you know, she, you know, he or she doesn't think about money like I do. I need to make sure they have some backup plan protections. Sure. That's when the abundance cycle kicks in. We work with clients all across the country, yep. and we want you to think about a bound wealth, the money guy team. The abundance cycle has never served us wrong. That's how we can continue to give away free information since 2006. And we're going to continue to be your resource. This thing is moving fast. There's lots of teachable skills, but there's also lots of scary things coming on, going on out there. Keep tuning in. We'll keep delivering, going beyond common sense. And we just love this. We love what you do. We love the comments. We love the emails. We love that you're subscribing to the YouTube channel. Just keep it going, and we're going to keep generating content. Money Guy team, out.